Hi, this is Dr. Zhang with Pharmacology of Local Anesthesia for Dental Hygienists. Today, we're going to talk about the classes of local anesthetics. We'll discuss the names of several local anesthetics from each class, and we'll also discuss the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion for each class of local anesthetics. Basically, there are two classes, so this should be fairly easy to remember. There are ester local anesthetics and amide local anesthetics. Ester local anesthetics consist of three sections of the molecule. There's a hydrophilic section, which is attracted to water, or water-loving, as we say when we look at the philic, which means love in Greek. And then there's the section of the molecule that does not like water, so we call it hydrophobic. The hydrophobic section and the hydrophilic section are connected by a linkage, and we call this an ester linkage. And that is where local anesthetic class gets its name. In this case, there are several ester and local anesthetics listed here. There is procaine, chloroprocaine, and tetracaine. And don't forget, novocaine, the original local anesthetic, was an ester form of local anesthetic. If we do have a patient who is allergic to novocaine, as they say, or an ester type local anesthetic, our first step is to then go on and use an amide local anesthetic. An amide local anesthetic also has three sections to the molecule. There's the water-loving section, or hydrophilic. There's the water-hating section, hydrophobic, connected by a linkage. In this case, it's an amide linkage instead of an ester linkage. So the amide local anesthetic gets its name from the amide linkage between hydrophilic and hydrophobic. When we look at the different local anesthetics for amides, we're going to see a number of types of local anesthetics that are used very frequently in dentistry. Lidocaine used to be the number one local anesthetic used in dentistry. But in this case, it's, free, it's being taken over by articaine, which is a newer local anesthetic, and it's fast becoming a favored local anesthetic by dentists. Bupivacaine is an amide type of local anesthetic that's extremely long-lasting. We often will use bupivacaine with the brand name of Marcaine when we look at anesthetics for pain management. So if you've had your wisdom teeth out, the oral surgeon most likely gave you an injection of bupivacaine, or Marcaine, before you left the office, and that kept you completely pain-free for eight to nine hours. Mopivacaine is another local anesthetic that is used frequently in dentistry. One of the things we need to look at is the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of local anesthetics. Most local anesthetics are absorbed very easily into the bloodstream. We typically use a subcutaneous or nerve block type of injection when we administer local anesthetics. They're distributed through the bloodstream and metabolized depending on what type of local anesthetic they are. An ester local anesthetic is metabolized in the blood plasma by an enzyme called pseudocholinesterase. When you have a patient who does not metabolize the ester local anesthetic in the plasma as well as a other some patients, you're going to find that the rate of hydrolysis or metabolism has an impact on the potential toxicity of the local anesthetic you use. There is a condition called atypical pseudocholinesterase, which is a hereditary condition. These people have an enzyme form of pseudocholinesterase that is not typical and it's much less effective. 
these patients could easily have a problem because of toxicity if you administer too much ester local anesthetic for those patients. Amide local anesthetics are metabolized differently for the most part. The primary site of hydrolysis or metabolism, otherwise known as biotransformation, is in the liver, like many medications. You must take great care when you have a patient who has liver dysfunction or severe liver disease. One amide local anesthetic is known for a higher incidence of a condition called methemoglobinemia. A patient with methemoglobinemia has a problem with the form of hemoglobin in their bloodstream. Normal hemoglobin has no problem whatsoever carrying oxygen and it gives your blood that nice red oxygen rich appearance. If a patient develops methemoglobinemia, the hemoglobin form in their bloodstream does not carry oxygen very well. Another name for this disease is sad blueberry disease because their patients tend to turn slightly bluish. This is a very serious condition and we will discuss how to handle this condition in later episodes. When we talk about routes of administration, there are several routes that we can use for many medications. There's the oral route, which is also known as the enteral or gastrointestinal route, GI. We can inject medications, and the injection form is typically called parenteral. We can administer medications through inhalation, like we would with an inhaler for asthma or COPD and we can also give medication using a topical means as we do in dentistry with topical anesthetic. We typically use topical anesthetic as a way to keep the patient more comfortable during the injection. So we'll take a cotton swab which looks like a q-tip with a very long handle and we'll place it in the jar of gel of, local of the benzokine topical anesthetic and we'll place it on the area that we're going to be giving the injection. This typically will anesthetize the top two to three millimeters of tissue and cause the patient to have much less pain, if any, during the injection. Typically, when we administer local anesthetic, we're using a parenteral because we're going to be injecting the local anesthetic. We usually use a subcutaneous or a nerve block for the local anesthetic administration. This infographic shows you a little bit about administration of local anesthetic. It has the, area, the different types of injection anesthetics listed on here. IV is a type of injection or parenteral administration of medications but we generally do not use an IV when we're talking about local anesthetic. You may see an IV used in an oral surgeon's office or a periodontist's office if they were going to do conscious sedation, but you're not going to see that with local anesthesia. An intramuscular injection here is where the needle goes all the way through the epithelium to the muscle tissue below and you've had an intramuscular injection in many cases if you've had an injection for muscle pain like a muscle relaxant. Subcutaneous is the typical form of local anesthetic injection and you can see that it is needle is directed just below the skin or sub Q. Now we've looked at the absorption distribution, metabolism, and excretion of local anesthetic. Here when we talk about excretion, you're going to be looking at the kidneys. Both esters and amides eliminate local anesthesia through the kidneys. A percentage of the local anesthesia that the kidneys eliminate has not been metabolized and it's excreted unchanged. 
you have to be very careful in how much local anesthetic you use for patients who have severe renal dysfunction or severe liver disease. These patients are not going to be able to metabolize the local anesthetic and they can very easily develop a very high toxic level in the bloodstream. So it's very important that you know the patient's health history before you administer local anesthesia. So stay tuned for more episodes.